all, will all be coming out tonight. Um, my name is Laura Godby, and I am the director of the U.S. Navy City Museum. And I am here tonight to present to you um, a topic about Marvin Shields, and it's called Honoring Shields, 50 Years After the Battle of Dong Shua. Before I even get started, let me talk about the word Dong Shua. Um, many people pronounce things very differently. Um, that's personally how I pronounce it. You will hear throughout, there are a couple media clips in here. Everybody pronounces it differently, so I just apologize for that in advance. Um, so why are we here tonight honoring Marvin Shields? Well, tonight, literally this very day, was the day that he died 50 years ago. He was significant on a, on a very surface level because he was the first Navy personnel to be killed in Vietnam, and he's been the only um, CV to be awarded the Medal of Honor. The Medal of Honor is a big deal. Um, it's the highest award for valor and action against an enemy force that can be, be bestowed upon any individual serving for the armed forces. It is the highest recognition that a military person can get. So that in itself, just these basic facts, is why we're here honoring Marvin Shields. But I would argue that Marvin Shields becomes more significant as you start to put him in kind of a larger historical context. First of all, um, as I mentioned, he was the first CV to win the Medal of Honor. There were CVs in World War II. There were actually 25, or 325,000 CVs in World War II. And not a single one of them won the Medal of Honor. So that heads up makes Marvin Shields very important. Um, in addition to this, when you look at how many CPs there were during Vietnam versus World War II, but also it's kind of important. Um, during World War II, as I mentioned, 325,000 CPs. During Vietnam, throughout the entire Vietnam conflict, there were only about 25,000 CPs certain Vietnam. And so, needless to say, there were 90 percent more CVs in World War II than in Vietnam. So you would have thought that well, at least one of them would have won this award, but they did not. And lastly, um, when Martin Shield was in Vietnam, there really were combat troops on ground. Um, it was still kind of, it was in that late advisory period when we really didn't have a lot of troops there. And so it was very significant that he got chosen for this award. What I'm going to talk about over the next 30 minutes or so is that Martin Shields is really more than just a Medal of Honor recipient. He is truly a legacy and a hero within the CDC and CD community. After 50 years, he is still the CD that every other CD emulates and wants to be. There's nobody who's ever taken his place. He is, he's the rock star of CDs. Um, so that's really why we're here tonight, and that's why there are actually two other celebrations just like this one, or commemorations just like this one, happening in other places in the country. Um, earlier today, there was an event at Fort Townsend um, at, at his grave site, and they had an event there. And then on Friday, there's going to be an event at the base in Wilford. So it's a big deal. So my presentation is really going to explore uh, four different things. First of all, a short biography of Martin Shields. And I say short because he was killed when he was 25 years old. So it, it's a short life, but it, it's an interesting one. Um, I'm also going to talk about CB Team 1104, what they did in Vietnam. The CB Teams had an extremely unique mission, and that's where he was and what he was doing when he was killed in action. Talk a little bit about the Battle of Dong Shua and what happened that day and how he ended up um, becoming killed in action. And lastly, the legacy of Martin Shields on the CD community. Martin Glenn Shields was born on December 30th, 1939, in Port Townsend, Washington, and he was the son of Victoria Miller Shields and William Glenn Shields. It appears from everything I've read about him, he was a pretty just average guy. Um, he attended local public school, and he attended Port Townsend High School. While he was in high school, he was, kind of, he was kind of a jock, you can see the photos. Um, he played football, he played baseball, he had hobbies like hunting and fishing. Um, 
the only the only thing that really seemed to be incredibly outstanding is that during his senior year, because of his outstanding participation playing football and because of his leadership just as a student, he received his high school's uh, student inspiration award. And so that perhaps was kind of um, hard miracle of what was to come. And in these photos here, you see him um, playing football. That was his senior year in high school. And you see him at a, at a dance. Um, 1958. I'm not sure if that was a prom or a fall dance or what that was, but that becomes significant because that's his high school sweetheart, Joan, who he ended up marrying a few years later. After graduating high school, um, he kind of he kind of looked around for a job. He, he kind of knocked around for about three years. He started off by going up to Alaska, where he uh, worked as a powder monkey for gold mine, the, the mineral basin mining company. And so what he did was he blew things up and exploded things and that kind of thing. Um, a little bit later on, he moved back to the Pacific Northwest, where he worked as a logger um, in the lumber industry. And it was during this time that he became really interested in mechanics, like auto mechanics. And so he ended up enrolling in a diesel mechanic correspondence course. And he loved it, and he was really good at it. And it was also during this time that he learned about the CBs. And he realized that there was an organization within the military where he could be a construction mechanic. And so he became quite, um, quite set on finishing his, his degree in, in uh, diesel mechanics and in joining the Navy. And for the record, he doesn't have an arm in that photo. I know it looks like it's missing. So on January 8, 1962, Shields enlisted in the U.S. Navy, and he attended boot camp down in San Diego, when they still had boot camp down there. Um, these are just some kind of fun photos. One of them, obviously, is his uh, boot camp class photo, and the photo on the far left is a kindergarten and clothesline. So that's where he clearly got some of his experience. And soon he finished uh, boot camp by May of 1962, and became petty officer. For those of you who are very, who know a lot about the CB community, you've all seen that picture on the right. That's his normal petty officer photo. We've all seen it. We've seen photos of it. We've seen paintings of it. But I really like this new one that I found as I was doing the research for this. The one on the left is a much more kind of human photo of him. You can tell he looks like he's about to start laughing. But he, he's, he's happy to be in the Navy. So from May of 1962 to May of 1963, he attended apprentice training school at Naval Air Station, Glencoe, uh, Georgia. And during that time, he ended up getting engaged with his soon to be wife. In September of 1963, he rated um, as a construction mechanic A school right here in Fort Wayne. He came out here um, to institute. In September of 1963, he was assigned to NCB 11, and he traveled with them to Okinawa, and he was part of the Alpha Company. And finally he came back in November, or in September of 64. And in November 1st of 1964, he was assigned to CB Team 1104. It's significant that he got assigned to a CB team because those were very, very hard to get into. You had to be, a, you had to be smarter than the average bear. They, they wanted people who were who excelled. And so it says a lot that he got chosen, especially as a third class, to be part of the CB team. So I kind of mentioned already, I think it's a hard one of life then. Um, he had a family. In November of 1962, Martin Shields married his high school sweetheart, who was that lady who was dancing with at the high school. Um, and they had a daughter named Barbara, who was born in January of 1964. Martin Shields only met his daughter twice. Um, he met his daughter the first time when he came back from Okinawa before he shipped out. Uh, before he came out here to do training for the CB teams, and then before he shipped from here to Vietnam with the CB team, he saw his daughter once again. But those were the only two times. And this photo is from one of those. I'm kind of guessing it's the fall one, but I'm not sure. The family is not sure either. So what is the CB team, and why is this important? Um, well, the CB team 
program it was interesting. It was actually started in the late 1950s, and it was it was more of, it was part of the larger Cold War buildup. And the idea was that these CB teams would be a socioeconomic tool of the Cold War, and that um, these teams would be able to go into areas that were either unstable, considered problematic, um, potentially turning into a communist area and that the CBs would be able to help these local communities by teaching them modern construction techniques, helping them help, help themselves, if you will. Um, so in the late 1950s, early 1960s, the Navy tested out this concept throughout Central and South America. For example, um, there was a CB team that went and helped the Chilean Navy build um, their Naval Academy. So it, it was that kind of work. But it wasn't until the early 60s, by 1962, that they determined the perfect combination for a CB team was 13 men. And it was going to be once a junior CEC officer, 11 CBs of, of mixed grades, and one hospital corner. Um, these CB teams would then get 13 weeks of specialized training out here in Fort Wayne. Uh, the training would include everything from language training, culture training, kind of counterinsurgency training, and most importantly, cross-training. One of the things that makes the CB teams during Vietnam very unique is that all of the members were cross-trained, meaning that an, uh, an equipment operator was able to do a construction mechanics job and vice versa. And they did this because they were in such small teams, and they all had to be able to do each other's job and cover each other's tracks. The CB team program was also unique in that these teams were effectively for hire. And by that I mean when they were first um, authorized by the Navy, they were authorized to exist, but they did not, they weren't funded. So the Bureau of Yards and Docks, which was the predecessor to NAFAC, didn't have the money to actually send them out. Somebody was going to have to pay NAFAC or VDOCs to actually send these teams out. And so they struggled with that for a while, um, and really until about 1963 when the U.S. Army, through their CICI program, which stands for Civilian Irregular Defense Group Program, hired the CB teams to go into some of these areas and build special forces camps. And so that is what CB Team 1104 was doing in Vietnam. They were there under the, being paid for by the U.S. Army through the CICI program to build special forces camps. This is CB Team 1104. Uh, Martin Shields was first assigned to this team in November of uh, 1964. Uh, they came out here for training and they shipped out to Vietnam in January of 1965. The teams did a lot of interesting things. This is, and again, um, for people who are really familiar with CB teams, oftentimes people think more of the, you know, building orphanages, that kind of thing. These early teams weren't doing that, nor were they staying in one place. So CB Team 1104, for example, first arrived in Vietnam in February of 1965, and they went to the uh, Tan Son Nhuc Air Force Base. It was a big Air Force Base. It was a huge Air Force Base, actually. Um, pretty near Saigon, wasn't really in the boondocks at all. Um, but what they were there to do was to do a lot of construction maintenance. Uh, projects included roofing, storage buildings, preparing foundations for hard stands, and taxiways, getting things ready for airplanes, grading roads, and several small repair and maintenance projects. One of the interesting things that they did was on the far left, they built the first CB team warehouse, because um, the program was starting to kind of catch on. They were realizing that they were going to have more and more CB teams, and so they were starting to gather their own material. In March of 1965, CB Team 1104 moved on. They left the comfort of a rather uh, modern Air Force base to go to Bensoy. And Bensoy was an area in very rural uh, Vietnam, very close to the Cambodian border. Um, and their purpose there was to give construction support to U.S. Army Special Forces 18 Detachment 324. And what they did there was they extended the camp, they built new camp buildings, new barracks, ammunition bunkers, um, earthen mounds around the camp, and helicopter pen. In addition, somebody like Martin Shields 
was specifically maintaining all the equipment that they needed to do that. Because just because you had a dozer, if you had a dozer in the middle of Vietnam, you had to someone there to take care of it. And so that's what Martin Shields was doing. And this photo here, it, this, this is a photo of the Special Forces Camp at Ben Soy in May of 1965. So this is after they had done all their construction. Um, and you can kind of see, you can see number one, the kinds of work that they were doing, but also where they were located. They were, they were out there. They were, they were definitely on the front lines. They then moved further north. On June 4th, 1965, they moved to Dong Chua. And Dong Chua is located about 55, 55 miles northwest of Saigon. And just to kind of point out, they basically went from here, that when they went to Ben Soi, they went all the way over here. They're out here in Tainan, and then they moved up. So they, they were going in areas that really the, the US forces had not been before at all. So the reason that they went to Dong Chua was, um, there was, a, there was another Special Forces camp there. It was Special Forces Camp um, it was the Free Corps Center. And there had been a camp there for a while, but it was a very rudimentary camp. Um, it didn't have a lot of protection. It was just sitting, it was sitting next to another village, if you will. And so their job, their plan, was they were going to build a brand new camp for the Special Forces. Um, this was a really significant camp in many ways because there was also a Siji camp there which meant that there were Vietnamese troops there and also Cambodian troops there. They were fighting in support of the South Vietnamese um, army. And so they had plans for extensive construction. Um, so in those first four days, from June 4th until June 9th, when the, when the battle started, they were doing what CBs do when they first arrived somewhere. They were buying supplies, hauling gravel, building small structures to store their stuff, clearing fields, detonating mines they were getting ready for a pretty large scale construction project. And then, these are just some random photos of Marvin Shields in Vietnam. Obviously, these were taken sometime between January and June of 1965. I don't have any locations or anything like that. This one, I have a feeling was taken at Ben Soy because those women look as though they're Cambodian. But, I was very lucky. Actually, we were all very lucky. Um, the family recently turned these over. And so there are new photos that, put it this way, I've been working at this museum for 15 years, and I have never seen these photos. It was, it was quite a treat. So June 9th, um, the Battle of Montreal happens. Um, it was a five-day battle, and it was really fierce fighting between about 1,500 to 2,000 Viet Cong, about 2,000 South Vietnamese troops, and 34 American military forces. But what I'm going to do, so you don't have to just listen to me, um, I found, we found a clip, a news clip at the time that's contemporary. And what's interesting about this is it really shows how at the time it was, the, it, at that point, it was the bloodiest battle that had ever happened in Vietnam. This is 1965. Um, the US was still to an extent the general public was supporting the war in Vietnam. There, there wasn't, none of that was going on. So you have to kind of take off those historical blinders and, and think about it. And I think that this little video clip does a great job of doing it. One of the bloodiest battles of the Vietnam War still echoes in Dong Thai as relief troops continue to pour into south. The South Vietnamese forces, backed by U.S. planes, are attempting to punch the communist Viet Cong from the surrounding jungle as the battered settlement counts its horrible losses. 1,500 Viet Cong swept out of the town during the night and they were well equipped as captured arms proved. They attempted to overrun the airstrip defended by 400 South Vietnamese. The attacks came in wave after wave as the Reds slaughtered civilians and set fire to their houses. They used other villages as human shields while they rushed the defending troops with grenades and flamethrowers. When dawn came, there was nothing for the survivors to do but leave the ruins of their town and seek food and shelter elsewhere. The toll was one of the heaviest in the war, at least 700 Reds killed, while the South Vietnamese forces counted 250 dead, including 19 Americans.
troops have been authorized by Washington to enter into active combat. American forces have been increased by 23,000 more men and are expected to reach 100,000 by next fall, including pilots from carriers. Sea-based planes have now been joined by B-52 bombers. 29 of the huge craft flew from the Pacific island of Guam over 2,000 miles of open water to bomb Viet Cong concentrations in South Vietnam and return. Two were lost. This fight followed by a day the shooting down of two Russian-built minks by air-to-air -air missiles fired from carrier planes. Soon, however, monsoon rains will end such air activity. So as you can see from that video, a, a contemporary piece, Battle of Nantua was a really, it was a big deal. And so it was significant. And so, and kind of hearkening back to my original question, why are we honoring shields? That in itself, is, it was a big deal. Um, we look back at the war, at the Vietnam War now, and we don't necessarily think of that when we the offensive, think of other battles as being much bloodier and that kind of thing. But at the time, it was, it was pretty bad. So what happened to Martin Shields at the Battle of Dongchua? Well, as I mentioned, a CB team is made up of 13 people. But at, at Dongchua at that point, there were only nine CBs there. Um, they didn't always travel together. That's another thing. That was kind of the importance of that cross-rating. Teams didn't always stick together. Oftentimes, they would do tell out. So about 15 minutes before midnight on June 9th, the camp was awakened by a lot of incoming fire, mortars, that kind of thing. Um, the first mortar hit the barracks and killed several Americans. And actually, Marvin Shields was injured in that first in that first attack. He had some shrapnel wounds at that point. Um, there were 20 Americans in the camp at that point, and in that L-shaped camp, as you can see up there, nine of the nine of them were in the north, and eight of them were in the west. And Marvin Shields was one of the American troops that was in the western part of the camp. And so throughout the night, throughout the darkness, he, he, he manned his machine guns and he fought off the Viet Cong. They, they were shooting all night long, despite the fact that he was already injured. In the early morning of June 10th, um, although he had gotten wounded yet again, he was actually during the night, he ended up being he was shot in the face with a bullet. Um, they realized that they were really in a lot of trouble and they couldn't just sit there, that they, they were basically sitting ducks. So, um, Shields assisted one of the Special Forces Americans in carrying um, one of the captains to the building, to their headquarters building. They're often hunkered down in the headquarters building, and so Shields and somebody else ran out and got them. That's incredible to me. Then at, at dawn, as, as the sun started to rise, they're like, okay, you know, how, how is this, what do we need to do? Um, and they realized that there was a machine gun next that was just taking out the, the headquarters building. That's like when every time somebody tried to leave, that they were getting shot. And so Shield volunteered to assist Special Forces Second Lieutenant uh, Charles Williams in destroying this Viet Cong machine gun nest. So he went with Williams um, to the nest. They took a rocket launcher with them, which um, was interesting because Martin Shields had never been trained on or used a rocket launcher before. And they successfully knocked out this machine gun. And they ran back to the headquarters building that they were getting shot at and ended up, um, they got sprayed with machine gun bullets and it effectively almost tore off Marvin Shields' leg. So he didn't make it all the way back to headquarters. He was on the ground, they ran out, they pulled him back in. Believe it or not, he was still fine at this point. Um, the, the, the record of it says that he was talking, he was actually pretty cheery, he was telling jokes, that kind of thing. He was in a good mood. They thought he was going to be fine. Um, by 2 o'clock on the afternoon of June 10th, they got a helicopter in there. He was one of the first people to be sent out on a helicopter because of the severities of his injuries, and he ended up dying on the helicopter. So, this is what Don Chua looked like after the battle. Um, we know that Martin Shields got killed, but you can see his heroicism um, ended up really saving a lot of this because imagine how horrible this looks here and how much worse it would have looked had he not gone out and stopped that machine gun and done what he had done. So just to kind of give you some perspective, um, 
The airfield is the road that, that's leaving out on the left side of the photo. The district headquarters, where Shields was hunkered down and all, most of the Americans were hunkered down, um, is in the upper left-hand quadrant. The tree line that's running across the top of the left is, indicates where um, the assaults were launched from. So that's where the Viet Cong came through. Um, the village of Dong Chua itself is in, um, is in the bottom right. And the schoolhouse wreckage is just down. See where all those helicopters are parked? Right, kind of in that big triangle. That's where the schoolhouse was. Um, and um, another pretty famous CV that many people know about, um, Johnny McCulley, Master Chief McCulley. Master, Master Chief McCulley was one of the CVs that was there. Um, he actually followed his training as he was supposed to because in those kind of hostile um, times, you were supposed to try to get out. And he was lucky enough that um, he took refuge in a sawmill, which is just off the bottom of the soda, which is why he got injured, but not nearly to the degree as he was. This is a view of the district headquarters where um, Shields was pulled into and they were all pulled, kind of hunkering down during the attack. This is a view of the buildings looking from the southwest. Special Forces Headquarters and the Jeeps that were there. So as you can see, the, the battle itself destroyed not only, I mean, it killed many, many people, Vietnamese and American, um, but it also completely destroyed the physical landscape as well. So Martin Shields was a hero from the very beginning. Um, because of the actions that he took, he was honored by the Vietnamese government. Um, as he was leaving Vietnam, he was posthumously awarded the Vietnamese Order of Gallantry with Palm and the Military Merit Medal. Those were the highest awards that the South Vietnamese Army could give at that point. And a year later, he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. Uh, his, it was given to his wife, Joan, and their daughter, Barbara, by President Johnson at the White House. And even though many of you have seen this, you probably have never seen this. Now he was holding his ground again, this time in Vietnam. A war that each day continued to produce its heartbreaking tragedies, violence, and heroes. Heroes like construction mechanic third class Marvin Shields, and Navy CB, who had been killed at Valley Floyd while serving with conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty. On the morning of September 13th, Marvin Shields was awarded the Medal of Honor. The award was accepted by Mrs. Joan Shields and her two-year-old daughter, Barbara. This is actually uh, Marvin Shields' Medal of Honor and the Medal of Honor certificate. Um, the museum actually has them. They're on display in our new Hall of Fallen Heroes, which you will all be invited to look at once I'm done talking. Um, and I'll read you the citation because, you know, it's one of these things that when I read it myself, when I finally read it out loud to myself, I realized that it had a lot more meaning. So, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving with the United States Navy CBT 11, 1104 at Dong Chua, Republic of Vietnam, on 10 June 1965. Although wounded when the compound of Detachment A-342, 5th Special Forces Group Airborne, 1st Special Forces, came under intense fire from the estimated reinforced Viet Cong Regiment employing machine guns, heavy weapons, and small arms, Shield continued to resupply his fellow Americans with needed ammunition and to return the enemy fire for a period of approximately three hours, at which time the Viet Cong launched a massive attack at close range with flamethrowers, hand grenades, and small arm fire. Wounded a second time during this attack, Shields nevertheless assisted in carrying out a more critically wounded man to safety and then resumed firing at the enemy for four more hours. When the commander asked for volunteers to accompany him to attempt to knock out enemy machine gun emplacement, which was endangering the lives of all personnel in the compound because of the accuracy of its fire, Shields unhesitantly volunteered for this extremely hazardous mission. Proceeding toward their objective with a 3.5-inch rocket launcher, they succeeded in destroying the enemy machine gun emplacement, thus undoubtedly saving the lives of many of the fellow servicemen in the compound. Shields was mortally wounded by hostile fire while returning from his defensive position. 
His heroic initiative and great personal valor in the face of intense enemy fire sustained and enhanced the finest tradition of the United States Naval Service. In addition to giving the Medal of Honor, Shields also was awarded the Purple Heart Award. One would assume that a hero such as Myron Shields would be buried in Arlington, but his family made a decision to bury him closer to his home. So he's buried at Gardner Cemetery in Gardner, Washington. And as I mentioned, um, that there are other commemorations going on today. The, the main commemoration, like the big NAPAC commemoration, happened at his graveside um, earlier today. Myron Shields is also um, listed on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Um, and sits beside many of his brothers and sisters. So, up to this point, we've talked a lot about the military and why he's significant to the Navy and that kind of thing. But I would argue that the legacy of Marvin Shields is bigger than that. And, and I say that because when he was injured, I and mean, when he died, and when he was awarded the medal, he was truly an American hero. He was somebody who was nationally recognized. The, the, the United States knew who Martin Shields was. And I think nothing says that more so in a way than this. This is the 20th anniversary of the magnificent sea beast, 1,000 home or not in Vietnam, building airfields, airships, hospitals, and docks for our troops and land, sea beast building equipment and delivering food for the Vietnamese. The first CD ever to win the Congressional Medal of Honor is 26 year old Martin P. Sufield, vice president to volunteer to knock out the Vietnam Kingdom. He got the gun, but he was killed on the way back to join his men. On our wife tonight, permit me to introduce his widow, Mrs. Martin Field. So let's have a tremendous hand. For those of you who didn't recognize who that was, that was Ed Sullivan. And so that would be the equivalent of being on like this night show, something like that. I mean, it, it's pretty, it's a big deal. Um, but Marvin Shields has continued, especially in the Navy, to just be a legacy and be a famous name. Uh, he was the first CB that they named a ship after, uh, the USS Marvin Shields was uh, built at the Todd Pacific Shipyards in Seattle um, in the late 1960s and was launched in October of 1969. Martin Shields' mother and his widow, Joan Shields, then remarried Bennett, um, christened the ship. And the ship was commissioned in 1971 as a destroyer escort and reclassified as a craft frigate in 1975. These are kind of the details about the ship. It was past forget. Um, we will find da, 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 decommissioning ceremony. Um, U.S. Marine Shields served for 21 years um, and made notable deployments to Grenada in 1983 and also during the per to the Persian Gulf in 1990 and 91. She was de decommissioned in July of two, uh, uh, July 1992. Um, she was stricken from the U.S. active fleet in January of 95 and given to, sold to um, Mexico, where she is now the ARM Mariano Absolado. But even though the shields as a ship is gone, his name remains absolutely everywhere. For example, Camp Shields in Okinawa. Um, it's one of the biggest camps that everybody knows about. There was a Camp Shields in, in Vietnam in July. Another one that I failed to put in here, right here, the, the NCTC Construction Mechanics School is the Marvin Shields Construction Mechanics School, which is where he went to a school as well. So it's a name that is really kept alive by the Navy. It's also kept alive by the community. 
Um, there's an AFW Post 26 in Fort Jackson, Washington. That's where he was from. Um, and so he, that, that post is dedicated to him. There's lots of information about him there. Um, there's a highway memorial sign by that location, that type of thing. The Society of Military Engineers even has an award named after Marvin Shields, which is presented annually to the most significant um, CV that shows the most outstanding contributions to construction and so forth. There's so many others. Um, for example, with NSCB 11 recommissioned in 2007, they, they named themselves the, the Marvin Shields Battalion. Here in Port Wyoming, um, Every year, the chiefs do their initiation process, and every year, the chiefs here reenact the Battle of Nashville. So every single chief on this base knows Martin Shields, knows what he stands for, and knows what he means. Um, there's even a Sea Cadet Battalion, um, the Martin Shields Sea Cadet Battalion in Lakeland, Florida. So his name has definitely lived on. So in conclusion, I would argue that Marvin Shields is more than just a man who was killed in action in Vietnam. He's more than just somebody who won a medal of honor. He's really somebody who is a legacy and a hero to the CEC and the CB community. And, he's, and it's that legacy and that heroicism which is why we're here tonight honoring Marvin Shields. Thank you. Do you all have any questions? Questions? Do you know how you learned about the seeds? I don't. I don't know. That's a question I should probably ask his wife. That's a good one. Are your parents all around? His parents are. How about the lieutenant who accompanied him uh, on the Silver Star, or <laughs> Silver Star, exactly. Anything else? Okay. Well, in that case, I would like to introduce Lieutenant Ted Pekowski, um, who is here representing Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 11 from Gulfport. Um, I would also, since you're here, like to thank you all of those really cool video clips he found for me and shared with me. And so, thank you that you made my presentation much, much better. Um, but he is here because uh, NMCB 11 is donating a fantastic new uh, Marvin Shields Memorial to the museum, and he is here to present it.